chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I want to talk to you about a, a, a little family in a little town called Bethany, which is about two miles outside of Jerusalem. It's a tight-knit family. They love God. They just want to please God. They just want to serve God. They love to hear the word of God. But then an unexpected crisis happens. And uh, I want you to understand that any time whatever word is preached, you have to understand that one of Satan's tactics is to attack you with the very thing you just heard. The Bible says that the devil comes immediately to steal the word that was sown. It's not against you personally. It's that you intimidate him when you allow the word to be settled in your heart. And so there are different types of hearers. The Bible says that some of you, when you hear it and you're in church, that's why some people go to these shouting churches, you hear the message and you're all excited. You wave your hanky, you do your tambourine, you do your dance, you, you do your Christian bunny hop. But it says when affliction or persecution comes, and the message translation says like this, because the shallowness of our character, the word gets thrown out. It takes no effect. Affliction means it's outside forces, outside pressures trying to get to you. You're getting attacked. Persecution. Affli I'm sorry, I got it reversed. Persecution, that's persecution. Affliction is when you are having mental anguish and you keep thinking about something over and over and over again to the point where it gets you. Now you're grouchy, you're irritable, hard to get along with. And so I want you to see this family. It's a very common story, but I want to give you some different, different perspectives on it. And so we have this tight-knit family. We've got two sisters. One's named Mary. One's named Martha. And they have a brother named Lazarus. And I want to take you on this journey here. And I want you to see these, this family in another way because we just read them like they're characters. But these were actual living people. Going through a natural crisis. So let's go to the book of Luke. It says, as they continued on their travel, Jesus entered into a village. And a woman uh, by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. So we see Jesus is traveling. He's coming from Jerusalem. He's going to Bethany. Runs into, uh, runs into this woman. What was her name? Martha. Martha. And she makes him feel welcome. Let's look at this. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the master... Hanging on every word. Now I want you to notice what's going on. Jesus meets this woman. And he decides to go home with her. There's a problem with that. Because Jewish rabbis did not hang around with women. It was a no-no. He's supposed to have gone to maybe the head of the household. But I want you to notice that Jesus is breaking the gender differences between the male Jews and the female Jews. Are you getting this? Yeah. Because you have to remember that the females were not allowed to sit with the males in the services and so forth. And so Jesus is beginning to break religious traditions, even in his actions. And so she goes home and, and he starts. Now get this. Can you imagine Jesus coming to your house and starting a Bible study? That's what he's doing. It says that Mary chose to sit at his feet and, to, and she soaked in everywhere. This is the most intense, most anointed, most powerful Bible study that is going on in the history. And, and Jesus is doing this according to the custom and the culture at that time to, to women. He's not teaching in the synagogue. He's not correcting men. But it's just these two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary's soaking it up, and everybody knows what Martha's doing. Martha's in the kitchen. Martha's got the vacuum cleaner out. Martha's dusting the stuff. Martha's putting out the setting and so forth. Martha's making sure everything's right. And as she's doing all this stuff, she's looking at Jesus. 
And she looks at her sister. What are you doing? You know what she's thinking. Because we know the story. Why isn't your buddy in the kitchen helping me? What are you doing? Can't you see we need to prepare a meal? Am I your slave? Are your hands broke? She looks at Jesus. Yeah. Looks at Martha. <laughs> looks at Jesus. Looks at Martha. I mean, looks at Mary. And you can feel the atmosphere trying to intimidate the anointing that's in that house just by the words that are not being exchanged from Martha's gaze into Mary's. And I would almost bet that Mary's just ignoring it because she's hanging on every word that Jesus is doing. And Martha's getting filled with contempt, mad as a morning, because the creator of the universe is in her house and she's worried about whether the fajitas are done. She's worried about the place setting. She's doing last minute cleanup. I mean, if you know last minute cleanup means you scoop up everything, put it in the oven, and hope nobody looks at it. <laughs> last minute cleanup. Trying to prepare the meal. Looking at Mary. And you know this conversation, this debate is formulating in her mind. Wait till he leaves. You just wait, girlfriend. He's sitting there all cute at his feet. I'm sitting here sweating in the kitchen trying to prepare a meal for him and so forth. I don't understand why you, know, why you think you're exempt from this. Just because Jesus is in the house doesn't mean we don't have duties and obligations. And you can feel it trying to rise up in their household. Do you ever think of it that way? The contempt? You ever go to somebody's house and you can tell the couple has been fighting? The way they look at each other, lips are straight, <laughs> snappy answer, hi, how you doing? Good. Did I say anything wrong? No. Husbands, if you ever do that, did I do anything wrong? They go, no, you did something wrong. Yeah. I recommend to you that you go upstairs into your room, sit down and think about it until she's ready to talk to you. <laughs> and when she does, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. That's all you say. Don't explain it. I'm still working on that. <laughs> Don't try to explain it. Don't justify it. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. And what that will do for you is it'll take one thing off that big list she has concerning you. Amen. And the, Arthur's <laughs> going, amen. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know this was going to be a comedy show this morning. <laughs> amen, pastor. Hallelujah. So let's take a little, let's, let's take a little look here. So Matt, this is the most intense Bible study going on. And notice this. <laughs> but Martha was pulled away by what? By what she had to do in the kitchen. Later, she stopped. Uh, she stepped in, okay, interrupting Jesus, saying, Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen? Can I ask you a question? If she has a problem with her sister, why didn't she go to the sister? Is she trying to embarrass her? What's going on? Now what you may not believe or get is that the culture at that time, if there's a male in the house and there's no husband, he's actually the head of that household. And so she's gone to him according to the custom. But I don't know about you. If I'm in trouble with my wife, which is never, <laughs> It's my faith confession. Y'all need to back off and agree with me. You should be stretching your hand forward and going, Amen, Pastor, we will agree with you. A bunch of Gentiles. Let me turn around and see if the congregation has changed a little bit. Now I forgot what I was going to say. I think I'm in trouble. I can't get past it. You don't go to somebody else and talk to them about your relative. You go to the person that you have a problem with. 
So either Martha's on some kind of ego trip, or maybe she's trying to embarrass her sister, or call her out. Maybe she's thinking Jesus will go, hey, wait a minute, that's right. She's doing all the cooking and the cleaning, and look at you. That's not happening. But we don't know why she decided to go and tell Jesus and, and, and complain to Jesus about Mary. But it makes me wonder sometimes, how many times do we go to Jesus and complain to him about other people who aren't doing what we think they should be doing? Now, I know none of you guys have never done that, but I believe that's in there for a reason. Now, I want you to notice Jesus' response. The master said, Martha, dear, okay, Martha, dear Martha, okay, you're what? Fussing. You're what? Fussing. What? Fussing. fussing. You're fussing about, you're fussing too much and getting yourself all worked up. Do you ever notice that when the desire to complain comes upon you that the only person that gets agitated is you? Unless the person you're talking to, you're complaining about them, then it's no longer a complaint or fussing, then it turns into a fight. Yeah. And it's amazing how easily we can get wrapped up in watching other people's behaviors and thinking that they should meet a certain mold when we ourselves sometimes don't meet the mold that he requires of us. And so Jesus, now I want you to notice, this. Jesus doesn't rebuke Martha for serving. But what he does is he does tell her, you know what? Your heart is right. You should be serving the master. You should be serving God. But the priority is the word comes first. Let's say that together. The word <coughs> comes first. But in her mind, See, that we have these preconceived ideas of how we think life is. One of the reasons that people get angry, the, reason, the, the main reason people get angry, is because things aren't going the way that you planned in your mind. And so you, you wake up in the morning, you have this plan, and then everything else gets, uh, creates a diversion. And it doesn't happen the way that you want, and so we get mad and we get upset. Is that true? Yeah. But why do we let it? Is it for our need to control? Because if we do it with things and objects and stuff like that, and then we try it on people, what we do is we become victims of the misery that we have created for ourselves. Yeah. And now I'm a miserable person. Why? Because I'm so mad because nothing's going my way. Frustrated, agitated, irritated all the time. And so we begin to compensate that in different ways. Some people hide out in their house. Now, they may be believing God for some a spouse or something, but you know what? Nobody's going to pull up to your house and go, hey, I heard you're lonely. <laughs> if you want to meet people, you've got to go where people are. If you need friends, the Bible says you've got to show yourself friendly. Yeah. And so we have to be the driving force. You're the one who determines the joy factor in your life. And if we would be honest, most of us are programmed for the negative. Let me give you an example. If you talk to someone who's been wounded most of their life, even though it's been 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago, for the rest of their life, no matter how nice you treat them, no matter what you try to do, they will hear everything through a dirty filter of woundedness. They will think you're going out to jab them, to control them, to manipulate them, to hustle them. They're going to have all these preconceived ideas. What is that? That's the Martha syndrome. We're trying to control the Marys that God sends into our lives. And so we hear woundedness. You're just trying to tell me what to do. No, I'm just making this. Husbands and wives are the worst at this. Men do and say things to make the problem that they see go, go get, get done quicker and easier. 
So they make suggestions. Dun, dun, dun. What the wife hears, you're trying to tell me what to do. You're trying to say I'm a dummy. You think I don't know what to do. And so, I see some of you guys shaking your head. Why your wife's not looking at you? Yes, sir. Amen. Hallelujah. Got to pray the word right here. I expect a big offering from you, man. I'm talking to you. Right and so, forever. You could be with that person for 10, 15, 20 years and have to explain it a million times or more. That's not what I'm trying. Some of you are acting like horses' heads now. <laughs> That's not what I'm trying to do. Men just make suggestions. I see a problem from my point of view as a male because I'm designed to go to war. I'm designed to slay dragons. I am designed with my brain to solve a problem. I don't care about the feelings. I don't care who's going to get hurt. I don't care what they think. I don't care what they say. And when I'm saying that, I'm not saying I'm trying to be cold and callous. Those are not factors to completing the job. Amen. We just want to kill the dragon. Let's take the dragon's head off. Let's try this. Well, I don't want the dragon to think we're mad at him. You know, because every now and then, it's not always fire that comes out. Sometimes these cute little rings of puffs of smoke, and you can just... And so we're designed different. Yeah. And in our differences, even we as Christians who've been to church for 10, 15, 20 years or more, we still don't know the difference because we have a tendency to lean upon the influence that the world gave us when we were growing up. That is the height of maturity, immaturity. And then we decide to do like Martha. Well, I would never act like a baby, but look at her. And yet we're guilty of the same thing. So Jesus is giving this Bible study. So here we are. We come to church and we hear the word. We hear the word. We hear the word taught. Times we see the signs and demonstrations of the word. The word gets in us. And we can see it, what needs to be done in everybody else. But the takeaway is we never see how we need to apply it to ourselves. Am I talking to anybody? All right, so let's go a little bit further. One thing only is what? Essential. And Mary has chosen it. She decided to sit at the master's feet. Okay? She decided to listen to the word. So Jesus explains to her that the word is first. It takes preeminence. So here's where we're at. When you come to church and you hear the word, do you make the decision then to let the word be the preeminence? That means it's the final authority. It's the judge. It's what decides what you should be deciding on. Because people are only as good as their word. When you... For example, in a church setting, when we agree to do a work, when we have people get into positions and so forth, they sign a paper. When you sign a paper, you're saying, I agree to these terms. And then when you don't do them, what does that show about your character? How does that reflect? And see, here's the thing, folks. If we don't be honest with ourselves and maintain our own integrity, why should I be integrity with you? If I can't have honor with me behind closed doors. And so now what happens is there was a time in history when if we agreed to do something, I would give you my word. It was settled. Amen. But then that wasn't enough. So we progressed on now I give you my word and I got to give you a handshake. Well, we shook on it. Well, that got worse because now we need contracts. Now we need lawyers. Now we need a, a, a notary public. Now we need it in triplicate. Are you getting this? So what happened? Society as a whole, our word means nothing. And because our words mean nothing, and because other people's words to us, they, it doesn't mean anything to them, we think it's okay for us to do the same thing. But yet it's not. Why? 
because Christians means to be like the Christ. And when we don't be like the Christ, Jesus, then is it not true when the world says that the church is full of hypocrites? Are we not being hypocritical when we sign on the dotted line and then we don't do what they say? Are we not being hy hypocritical when you get a credit card, you say you're going to pay so much every month, and you don't, you decide to skip the pay because you wanted a Mountain Dew and a candy bar and you don't have the payment, and when they call your house, you lie about it, and you get mad when all they're doing is doing their job of trying to fulfill the covenant that you made with them? And so we get fussy. Our integrity is shot. And we don't put much emphasis on integrity. When we do see a movie or something like that, where people are being honorable and full of integrity, we cry. That's our response is we cry when we see soldiers who die for the cause. When we see this woman stand up for herself and die for the cause, we have tears flowing. Yet not an understanding that you and I can do the same thing when it comes to the word of God in our life. To be people of integrity and honesty and quit looking at everything else and everybody else's behavior. And this is what they're doing. And because she's acting like a donkey, I'm going to act like a team of donkeys. What's your takeaway when you come to the Bible study? Now notice this. Let's jump ahead a little bit. So we have Mary and Martha. Two sisters. They got a brother named Lazarus. Let's jump to John chapter 11. One. A man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, in the town of Mary and Martha. So here these two women, they sat in a Bible study. Jesus leaves. A while back, a couple of weeks passed by. He gets word that Lazarus, Mary's and Martha's brother, is sick. And the Bible tells us when you do a word study on it, it was a sickness that came on suddenly and is leading to his death. The guy's about to die. Let's go to verse 2. This was the same Mary. <laughs> this was the same Mary who what? Massaged. Massaged the Lord's feet. This is the one who uh, anointed his feet and rubbed the anointing oil. And massaged his feet, okay, with aromatic oils and worshipped him. She wiped them off with her hair. It was her brother who was sick. Now, I want you to notice right now. Right now, he's sick. Okay? So here we see another side of Mary. Not only does she seem to be a good uh, 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 woman who listens to the word of God, but she also knows how to worship God. She has a balance of the word and of the worship. Are you getting this? There's a healthy balance going on. So the sisters send the word to Jesus, and when Jesus is getting this word, uh, when it, it takes about two days to travel, when Jesus is getting this, uh, sometimes, depending where they're at. Anyways, when Jesus gets the word, Lazarus is only sick. He's not dead yet. Now let's look to verse 14. When Jesus got the message, he said, this sickness is not, what? Fatal. It will become an occasion to show God's glory. Now, wait a minute. I don't know if I've ever heard a message preached where when Lazarus got sick, it revealed God's glory. But the answer is right there, and we're going to tackle it. I'm going to show you how God's glory is. See, sometimes we go through things. Let me tell you where Pastor Karen and I are at. We are believing God. For an Azusa Street healing manifestation, outpouring of God. Amen. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired of God's people being sick and tired. Amen. And we've been crying out and we've been studying. It. We need a healing move. Yes. We need healing yes. to be in the house again. But a healing revival. See, here's the thing about a revival. How many of you would love a revival? Raise your hand real high. Yeah. Those of you who raise your hand real high, you couldn't hang with a revival because you don't come to church enough. 
See, coming sporadically does not qualify you for a revival because a revival happens every day, every night. A revival happens like in the book of Acts chapter 2 where they went to church every single day. And when they went to church every single day, mighty signs and wonders happened. You can't just come in sporadically, check in, hope to get yours, go back and be gone for six weeks. We don't qualify for a revival. We don't want it bad enough. And you can tell by our attendance. You can tell by our worship. You can tell by our giving. You can tell by our lackadaisical attitude. We want God, but we want God on our terms and on His terms. We got to do it on God's terms. We have to assemble. We have to be in one mind and one accord. We all have to want the same thing. I am desperate for God. I don't want to occasionally see him. I don't want to pop in every six weeks. I don't want to let my business, my social life, my family, or anything else distract me. I need a touch from God. And if I got to do what I got to do to get what I want, that's what I got to do. But showing up every now and then doesn't qualify us for a revival. Over half of y'all couldn't hang. And the Bible prophesied about you. In the last days, people will forsake the house of God. And we find substitutes. Now we've got a soccer match. We've got a softball game. We've got to watch football. We've got to go over here and do a barbecue. And we take God's holy day that he told the children of Israel and us set aside for him. We put it now. If we can fit God into my schedule for his day, I'll see what I can do. And we have the audacity to want to believe God for mighty signs, wonders, and miracles. When we don't qualify for it, we're no different than a bunch of beggars. We don't want to have to work for what we want. We don't want to have to pray. I just want it dumped in my lap. Just give me a stimulus check, God, and I'll be okay for a couple more weeks. I don't want to show up in the house of God to help clean up because we're getting visitor. I've got things to do. I'm at home on Facebook. Post, share, smiley face. Oh, God, I'm desperate for you. And he's crying out, I'm desperate for you. When are we going to meet like we used to when you first got saved? What happened to your love? Where's your fire? Why'd you let your love grow cold? Where's our romance? Where's our intimacy? Try that on your wife. Hey, I'm just showing up. You know what I want. Huh? I'm not trying to be hard. I'm being real. I'm desperate for God. But at the way that we're going, we can't even get pastors from other churches to be in agreement. Fussing, competing, fighting. As it just, it's just insane, incredible. Jealous over one another. And we want God to pour out because we're in one mind and one accord. <laughs> Fat chance. Did you know that some of you don't even know some of you in church? Shame on you. That's your family. You should know every person in your family. You should know what's going on in your family so you know how to pray. But you come in and you dash out like it's nothing. But you want to move of God. I just love Jesus. This is a family business. Jesus goes to Mary and Martha's house, gives them a Bible study, and then a crisis happens. Now their brother Lazarus is sick and sick unto death. Jesus decides to wait two more days. During those two days, Lazarus dies. They heard the word, and a crisis came up. Mary listened to the word. She worshiped the word. Martha was busy doing anything. Martha's always gotten a bad rap over this stuff. You ever notice that? 
But I want to show you something that you may have never known about these two women. Turn to someone and say, Pastor's really on it today. Notice this, John 11, verse 2. <laughs> I, we already covered that. Let's go to verse 3. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. Master, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. Both girls put out a message, put out a plea for Jesus to come to heal the sick. How long do we have to continue to plead and beg God to come and heal our sickness? Mary showed us the key. If we put the word first, and if we would get back to worship. Amen. Some churches, and I think all musicians, I'm going to pick on musicians. A lot of musicians want to perform instead of worship. They don't trust the anointing. They trust their ability. You have to trust the anointing. A lot of church attendees are the same way. They trust the facts, they don't trust the word. They trust what the doctor says, but they don't trust the anointing. Yeah, I'm going, I'm, I'm past six years of having no eye. I am still to this day believing God for another eye. I don't care how long it takes. If it took Abraham 25 years, hey, I'm catching up to you, brother. I went to the doctor, I had an do eye doctor's appointment. He sat in his chair, rolled back, said, this is fantastic. He said, your eye has settled. You don't need a shot. You don't have scarring. You don't have any more bleeding. You're, you have adapted. Now, there is a baby, what is it called? Cataract forming. Now, listen. Here's what I'm believing God for. Now, this is just me. Maybe you can join your faith with mine. Billy Burke's secretary had cataracts in her eyes. That's right. And... <laughs> She said, I work for a healing minister. I'm not going to tell him I'm sick. So she one day is washing her face and the cataracts fell out of her eyes and into the sink. Yeah. And was healed. Right. I haven't washed my face so much since I've heard that. <laughs> what am I doing? Word and worship. Yeah. The word and worship is an intimate marriage. It's what heaven is filled with. Not fussing. It's filled with the presence of the word. It's filled with worship. But we think if we do certain behaviors and make people do certain things, then everybody will line up. Maybe we'll get something. When you come here, and the praise and worship team starts and you just sing in a song, you're just singing a song. There's a difference between singing along with them or worshiping with them. Amen. Their job is to be in front of the army to clear a path for us to get into the presence of God. Amen. That's what they do. That's what the Old Testament said. Hey, you going to war? Yep, put the worshipers in front. That's what I'm saying. Army, Jason, get up there. Well, go on. Hazel? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Put the worshipers in front. Because the worship creates a path to your heart for the word. Yeah. But if we come to church, or if we don't come to church, if we just pop in every now and then, you can't call yourself a Christian and be an occasional attendee. That's not an attendee. That's a visitor. But you have the audacity to want to believe God for a miracle? Huh? That's like saying, I, I work at Walmart. I'm not going, but I expect a paycheck. Come on, come on. Lazarus is sick. Many of us, we've been in the word, like Mary and Martha, yet sickness still comes to our house. Wow. Well, you know, uh, Jesus is a healer and he healed Lazarus. Well, yeah, but that wasn't the greater glory. And he was not sick for the glory of God. I'm going to show you what actually happened. Is anybody learning anything? Yes. 
turn to someone and say, that smell is my flesh burning. And let me say this, I take none of this back. All right, John chapter 11, verse 4. When Jesus got the message, he said, this sickness is not fatal, but it will become ooh, an occasion to show God's glory. It's an occasion to show God's glory. He is not saying that when you get sick, it is for the glory of God. It's not what he's saying. But Jesus is imparting hope into her. And you have to remember that when he got this message, Lazarus is sick. But when he got there, what happened? That sickness turned into death. Is that true? All right, let's go to the next verse. Jesus, let's go to John chapter 11, verse 5 and 6. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. It's a family, okay? But oddly, but oddly, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he didn't panic. He didn't gird up his loins and ran to the house. He stayed where he was for two more days. Our crises does not panic God. And God, Jesus is showing us right here, when you hear bad news, the first thing you need to do is refuse the spirit of fear yeah. to come in and say, it's time for you to panic, buddy boy. Where are you going to come up with the money? How are you going to fix this? What are you going to tell her? What about him? What? Because you've been faithful in the word and in the worship. I can always count on the word. And I, he can always count on my worship. I said I can always count on his word. And he can always count on my worship. Can he say that about you? Well, you know, uh, you know the Dr. Fauci said, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, what does God say? Come on. Now we have to do what we feel led to do. I understand that. But when you put more emphasis on, you know, uh, MSNBC, than you do the Word of God, there's a problem. Amen. Are you getting into this? Amen. Lazarus is sick. Jesus, I've got a crisis. Why aren't you moving? Hello? We need money. My husband, my wife, my kids. Hello? Woohoo! I'm in panic mode. God, why aren't you doing anything? I am. I'm waiting. Um, can we kind of hurry it up? I'm waiting. What are you waiting for, God? I'm waiting for you to calm down and trust me. Fear is the absence of faith. And a panic mind and a panicked heart shows that you're not in alignment with the word. How do I get in alignment in the word when there's a panic? I worship. My worship brings me back into alignment with the word. Amen. Am I talking to anybody? Yes. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Turn to someone and say, pardon me, that smell is my flesh burning. He waited two more days. <laughs> when Jesus finally got there, if I say finally, he found Lazarus already dead for four days. So Lazarus had died in the meantime. Let's look at the next verse. Bethany was, uh, was near Jerusalem. Okay. It was just a couple of miles away. It's about two miles away. Let's look at the next verse. <laughs> and many of the Jews were visiting Martha and Mary, sympathizing with them over their brother. Picture the atmosphere. Here's what we would think. Well, Jesus, you're too late. I knew it. This is how I think sometimes. This is, this is my sin. The Bible says in the book of Romans, anything that is not a faith is sin. So when my eye didn't get healed when I thought it should have been healed, well, Lord, too late now. The doctor already put a death sentence on it. Yeah, but... My crisis isn't his crisis. My timetable is not his schedule. If it's too late, had you been here? Now, why would they say that? The Jewish belief was at that time that when a person passed away, 
For three days, the spirit would stay around the body seeking an opportunity to return. So day one, when Jesus heard it, they believed that there's a possibility for Lazarus to return. Had Jesus been there, the spirit would have entered the body. No problem. That's what we believe. It's preconceived ideas. But now it's four days later. But our tri tradition, our custom says only three days. You're past the terms and conditions of what I believe. You're, you didn't get that. You're past the time frame that I think you should have done this. You're too late, Jesus. You had three days. You know our custom. It goes like this to you. Well, you, we had three days. You know what the doctor said. You know what the lawyer said. You know the terms and conditions. You knew there was a deadline. Yeah, I chose to go past your deadline. Well, this is not funny. Now Lazarus is dead. You're supposed to be the author of life. You're not. Or, I thought you were my provider. And I lost this anyways. What's the problem? Well, I've been trying to teach you how to manage your finances according to the Bible through tithe and offerings. You choose to keep doing your own things, getting a whole bunch of credit card, getting yourself in debt. I can't teach you financial responsibility unless you do it my way. Come on. Why should I bail you out so you can make another mistake? See the audacity of things that we, we think about God. Well, I'm trying to get out of debt. Get rid of your credit card. Stop going to the corner store and paying $2 for a 16-ounce soda. Why don't you just go to H-E-B, pay 96 cents for a two-liter? Get your lazy butt up. We pay for things for convenience. Convenience has a cost. Well, I'm believing God. You know, uh, the doctor said I need to lose some weight. Push yourself away from the buffet. Don't go to restaurants that have buffet in the title. Or corral. Are you getting any of this? See, we have these mindsets where we can justify ourselves and we put God at a certain place where we have certain expectations of Him. But in my years of walking with the Lord since 1982, I have realized very quickly God never does it the way that I thought He should have done. He doesn't get the memo. He doesn't understand the deadline. He doesn't understand the time frame. I sent you my expectations. I prayed about it. I complained about it. I busted. I even cussed about it. I hope that wouldn't get you to hear me. I did all these things. I got religious. I fasted. Look at me. This is me fasting. Yes, Pastor, I'll volunteer for the nursery. I'll take those demons, those children on. I'm that desperate. You ever notice when people get in trouble all of a sudden they start coming to church a lot? Isn't it amazing how we subconsciously know what the answer is? But once the problem is solved, we think we can just, okay, I'll be here for my next problem. Next time i got an issue, know where to find you. Lazarus is dead. Too late. Time period's up. Well, it doesn't look like God's going to heal this thing. We might as well go ahead and get ready to file for chapter 13. Doesn't look like God's going to come through. And I thought this tithing offering stuff works. Well, I don't see what church attendance has anything to do with it. I don't know what his case is. I'm trying to get you to heaven. Amen. Let's go to the next verse. Are you all with me still? Yes. Let's say by faith. I love Pastor John. I love Pastor John. Turn to somebody else and say, happy anniversary. happy anniversary. So many of the Jews are coming to visit Mary and Martha. They had seven days of mourning. Days of weeping. So I want you to see the atmosphere now that is being created. We're just casting demons out of children. It's okay. 
I want you to see the atmosphere that's created in Mary and Martha's house. This is the same place where the creator of the universe had a Bible study, the anointing. You know the anointing had to stay there for a while. And now, because of the circumstances, everybody's crying. How many of you know that sometimes when we face a crisis, we don't want a solution, we want sympathizers? Yeah. How are you doing? Well, I'm glad you asked. Wait a minute. I can always tell when I'm counseling people, there are people who listen and there are people who overtalk me. The overtalkers don't want a solution. They just want to hear themselves talk. It's an old, it's every, every counselor knows that. Every therapist knows that. You don't really want an answer. You just want to continue complaining. Now the mourners are in the house. How many times have we gone through a situation and we don't dare run to Jesus, we just invite the mourners to come in? Now I've got to tell everybody on Facebook I'm going through something. Sad emoji, sad emoji, sad emoji. <laughs> Please pray for me. Please pray for me. Please pray. What do you want me to pray for you? Lord, please help them get their head out of their rear end. Let them, let them wake up. Huh? Let them wake up to the reality that you can still do a miracle. You're still in business. You're still on the throne. You still have more mighty angels to drive away the demonic horde that are present. You're, they're still filled with the Holy Ghost. They're still a supernatural people. Signs and wonders shall follow them. They just need to get back into the Word. And it starts by getting back into worship. Amen. Lord, I don't understand what's going on. I want to cuss. If you weren't here on Wednesday, you missed it. Dynamite message by Pastor Karen. I encourage you to go see it on you uh, online. She ripped the flesh off of me. Made me feel like she was Jeffrey Dahmer and put me in a barrel full of acid. All my flesh did. I had to repent because of my attitude and my other attitude and my attitude that fed into that attitude. We do the same thing, though, with God. We treat him like he's another person. We expect him to fulfill his word, but we don't mind breaking ours. We had that marriage with him. Your word told me to be a devoted spouse to you, Lord. I'm not going to cheat on you. I'm not going to commit adultery on you by putting something else more important than you. I don't care about this event, that event. You have to be first. When I'm going through something, and here's what I do. When I go through something, I'm very select on who I let know what I'm going through. Because I don't want a bunch of mourners showing up. Oh, you poor thing. I remember back in 1939, Aunt Matilda went through the same thing and gosh darn the whole church prayed. And we took up an offering and she died anyways. You know, my... Get out of here. And back in 1956, you know, Uncle Fred did this and then the pig died and ran over and it just the barn collapsed and all that stuff. And I know uh, I know your pain, brother. <laughs> I want somebody like Miss Deborah. I'll be honest. No! We're not gonna have that devil. What do you think you're doing? You better get yourself out of here. You that's that's the kind of faith I want to be surrounded with. Now, at the time, I may be thinking, I'm not in that kind of mood. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. Don't, you know, us faith people, we can get on each other's nerves sometimes. <laughs> no, we're not having none of that. I'm sorry I was looking for a mourner. <laughs> don't you want to mourn? Don't you want to at least go, <laughs> I'm sorry you're going through this stuff. <laughs> can I buy you a cheeseburger? Yes, you can. <laughs> I want to be surrounded by people of faith. When they go through a crisis, I want to know that the first thing they do is they drop to their knees and they worship. 
and that worship ushers in that word. It's not about a feeling, it's not about a performance, it's about getting tapped back into the anointing, the power and the presence of God that can do in me and through me what I can't do on my own. Are you getting this? Yes. Uh, like Mary Martha. Oh, thank you for coming. Another casserole, put it on the table. Thank you for coming. Isn't it funny how we do things to feed our flesh? But we don't do things to feed our spirit? When I go through a crisis, the first thing I do is I, I play some, I play some music. I'm gonna put up something that stirs up my faith. I don't want to harden up. I want to, I want to cry. Because I want to make sure I'm tender in God's hands. I want that kind of crying that is the snot bubble. <laughs> snot all over my face, tears, can't see. Nose is dripping down to the ground. You think I'm kidding, I'm not. My wife has seen me like this before. Just, just, just a snot hanging down. I'm not trying to go, hey, baby. <laughs> I don't care. I need Jesus. And I'm not going to perform for you. And I'm going to get into that worship so I can get that word activated in my life. I want to be surrounded by mourners. Well, sometimes we do. You can always tell the people when, when they're going through something... You know, who want mourners? They'll, they'll come in and... <laughs> They're just waiting for you to go, Hey! You okay? <laughs> I'm so glad you are! <laughs> to be honest with you, when I see it, I go the opposite direction. Because <laughs> I'm not going to build a campfire. I'm not going to play more harmonica. I'm not going to sit and weep with you. We're not going to roast, you know, s'mores. I will help you lace up your combat boots. I will help you put on your armor of God. Huh? And while you're getting ready, I have no problem standing in front of you, but I'm not fighting the battle for you, but I'll fight the battle with you. Are you getting this? Oh, but I just want my mourners. You know, I grew up this way. I'm just used to mourners coming over because I was treated badly. Yeah, but how have you been since you went to the cross? God's been good, then act like it. Amen. Stop dumpster diving into your past. Right. Am I talking to anybody? Yes, Look at somebody and say, I tell you what, I don't know about that man sometimes. <laughs> Can I go a little further? Thank you. I was going to anyway. I don't know what you're talking about. So many of the Jews came to visit. Let's go to the next word. Martha heard that Jesus was coming, okay, and went out to meet him. Mary remained in the house. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Martha's the chick. Can I say that? Martha's the girl. Martha's the baby doll. Martha's the honey. Martha's the woman who didn't listen to Jesus at the Bible study. But now she's the one running to him and the one who worshiped at his feet. She's staying in the house with the mourners. Because it's too late. I don't see what difference it's going to make. I don't see what the excitement is. I'm just going to stay. See how the roles yeah. change? And yet Martha's always been the one that's been downplayed when it's preached. Martha missed it. But she's going out to run for Jesus now. And the one who's worshiping, now she's the one who's missing it. See, it's, the takeaway is this. You can come to church and you can hear the word. But when a crisis comes up to challenge the word that you heard, how do you respond? Not react. Because reaction is, a, is an action to a stimulus. Respond means you stopped, you paused, you thought about it, and you allowed the Holy Spirit to give you a course of action. Yes. Jesus has come. You know what she heard? The word that was in my house, that filled my house with the anointing, 
is coming back to my house. But Mary, well, you know, it's too late now. I don't see what's the use. This relationship's not going to last. It's never going to happen. Yada, 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 bada, bada, bada. Turns out, say, I'm not guilty of that. Maybe one person tried to whisper, the rest of you just chicken out. I ain't saying that. Martha said, Master, if you could have uh, been here, my brother would not have been dead. Remember, they believed in that three-day theory. She said, well, now he's dead, but if you were here, I know you could have done something. Let's go to the next verse, John chapter 11, verse 22. But notice what she said. This is the woman who did not pay attention at the Bible study. Message translation. Even now. That's faith. Hebrews says that now faith is. If you're not ready for it now, you're still in the hope state. That's okay. Stay there. Until you get more word and worship. When you know it's going to do it now. Even now. Whatever you ask God, I know he will give it to you. So... Here we see another side of Martha. Not only did she serve in the ministry of helps by providing food, but now we see her. Faith is being built up inside her heart. How many of you see this now? Yeah. Okay. So we see another side of her. Let's go to the next word. Even now. Turn to say even now. Yeah. Let me pause there. Let me just flow for a second. What situation have you given up on that is hopeless? You're sitting at home with the mourners. Never going to happen. It's never going to change. God's never going to come through. I've waited all these years. I'm just going to sit here with the mourners. Or could I challenge you to become a Martha. Yeah, she was a busybody. She didn't put the word first, but she's getting something now. She had time to think about it. So now she says this thing, even now. My brother's dead, but even now. This relationship's not going like I wanted to, but even now. These finances aren't here yet, but even now. Are you getting this? Even now. What is your even now moment that you need? Even now. What is it that, like Mary and Martha, it's too late. Things will never change. Something radical is taking place. Even now. Turn three people and say, even now. Yeah. Are you ready for your even now? Is what I want to know. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Even now, <laughs> I know whatever you ask God will take place. Now I want you to notice this. Jesus said, your brother will what? Yeah. Will be raised up. All right. So he's telling her the truth. She misinterprets what Jesus said. You know why? Because she's not thinking in the now. Now faith is. She misinterprets and says, it's true, Lord. In the resurrection, I know he will come. So what is she doing? She's put it off now to the future because now she feels it's impossible because the three days of mourning have gone by and the spirit must have left the body and it's too late. Yes, he'll be raised up. This is what we do. We get this religious mindset. Yeah, but God's in charge. God's not in charge. The Bible says right now that the devil is the God of this world. That's why it's in a mess. God is in charge of your life if you let him be in charge of your life. But letting him be in charge of your life requires obedience. And if you are obedient in some things and disobedient in other things, you're not obedient. You're unleavened. Amen. You either are all the way or none of the way. <laughs> you can't.
can't pick and choose the ones that you want. So she got religious. Now, one of two things we get out of it. Yes, Lord, uh, I know that he'll be raised from the dead in the resurrection and God will raise him up. Now, here's what we need to look at. Number one, maybe she was listening at the Bible study that happened at her house. And that's where she got it from. Or maybe she learned it as a child growing up. That there'll be a resurrection. Either way, she has it. She's not sitting at home with the mourners. She has hope. Hope is the precursor to faith. Are you getting any of this? So if you're hoping for something, don't give up. But if you'll get more worship and more word, your hope will turn to faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Pastor Karen taught that a couple weeks ago from a totally different angle I've never seen. I thought, my God, that woman's brilliant. No wonder I married her. <laughs> because your hope can turn into an even now. How many things have we just let go and sat down with the mourners? But we know the religious concept. Well, you know, God's in charge. Then. How you doing? Well, you know, and the creek don't rise, and the barn don't burn, and he ha he ha he ha. Good greasy chicken. Does everybody see this? So she knows the word. She obviously heard it. Now let's go this. You don't have to wait for it. You don't have to wait to the end. I am right now. If I say it right now. I am what? Right now. Even now. Right now. Even now. Right now. I am right now. Resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, <laughs> will live. And everyone who lives, oh man, does everybody see this? He is filling this woman up with the word. That's what she needs. That's what we need. The only thing she said was, well, he's dead. But she was stating a fact, but it wasn't the truth. Because facts can change, but truth remains. So even now. And so Jesus said, well, right now, I'm taking your even now, and I'm making it right now. I am the resurrection. Things are subject to change. Okay? And if you believe, you will live and you will not die. Then he says this. Do you believe this? That's where we stand today. If you want a revival, do you believe you need to do what needs to be done to get it? Are you still going to call God on your terms? Are you like the Jews going to set the terms and conditions for three days of mourning? Actually, turn into seven. It's three days of visitation, seven days of mourning. You're going to prolong your misery? Or are we going to say, Lord, even now, whatever condition, whatever requirement I need to do. See, we've taught this for years. God's word is conditional. The Bible in the book of Revelation makes it very clear. If you do these things, then these things shall come. If you don't, then, don't, then they won't. Choose. He did in the Old Testament. I set before you blessing and curse. Life and death. Choose. And then he gives you a hint. Here's a hint. Choose life. It's a lot better than death. He tells you how to live prosperous. It's very easy. But we choose not to. A lot of people get upset when you start talking about tithe and offering. And all this. We've had people leave the church over. That was their choice. Well, it's my money. It's not. It doesn't have your name on that. It says in God we trust, not you. Are you getting it? People get it. Well, we don't believe that healing is for today. Stay sick. Stay broke. I don't care. Give your angels my address. Bring it to my house. You're not going to get in a religious debate on what you believe. 
Well, I'm just going to give him a piece of my mind. You ain't never seen it, but you swear you've got some. <laughs> and Jesus is giving this woman that he loves, this, this dear sister, who at first was so busy, she didn't hear the Bible study, but now he's doing makeup work with her. And he said, well, you probably missed what I said the first time. Let me tell it to you again. See, there are no flunkies in the school of the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you don't get it now, you'll go through it again until you get it. Amen. So you can prolong your misery or you can get it over with, get your bonus check, your trophy, and move on to the next one. It's all up to you. We prolong our misery. And so Jesus is telling her, I'm the resurrection life. The question is, do you believe this? When the pastor preaches on finances, do you believe it? When, when a, a message is being taught on healing, do you believe it? Despite your sickness and how you've been sitting at home with the mourners. You know who the number one mourner is now that will come to your house? Google. This is Sister Google. She will find you all your symptoms. She'll help you make a decision. Brother Google will tell you the expectations. Look for this. This will happen. Your nose will rot off. Those are the mourners of today. So Jesus is giving her another Bible study. And then he's saying, do you believe this? What's your takeaway when you come to church? Well, I don't know about that. Pastor John's crazy. I am. Thank you. The Bible says he uses the foolishness of this world to make smart people go, what in the sand hill? Let's go a little bit further. Yes, Master. Here she is answering. All along I have believed that you are the Messiah. She's trying to get into a religious thing again. Okay? You're the Messiah, the Son of God that comes down, that comes into the world. After saying this, she what? She went to her sister Mary and uh, she told Mary, hey, the Master was asking for you. Nowhere do we read that Jesus said, go get your sister. She's bailing on <laughs> Okay, you're trying to trick me, aren't you? So now she goes to get married. Where's Mary? At home with the mourners. This is how we see it sometimes. Hey, where's brother so-and-so? At home with the mourners. Isn't he going through a crisis? Yeah. Why is he at home with the mourners? Well, you know, they're, they're not feeling well. Well, the Bible says to have the elders of the church lay hands in the prayer of faith, she'll heal the sick. Well, it's not tongues. And there's no interpretation to it. See, what we have done in our day is we make the word adaptable to us. If God's word is convenient to my schedule, I'll do it. If it's inconvenient, if I don't feel like coming to church today, I'm not going to come. Romans calls you a carnal Christian, a child, you're still an infant. I don't care what you've done in the ministry. I don't care what ministry you served in. I don't care if you taught, prophesied, and walked on water. If your feelings can override your duty and obligation to God, Romans calls you a carnal, a baby. I can offend you by the things I say because of your feelings. But the Bible says that strong meat belongs to those that are mature. You can handle it. You hear something tough, you go, I, I can take that. Bring it on, Pastor John. Come on, Pastor Karen. Keep it, Sharon. Are you getting this? Well, I just didn't feel like coming. Hmm. Lazy. But we want a revival. We want God to show up. But you don't show up. We want God to move, but we don't move. We want God to honor His word, but we don't honor our word. And we have this audacity. Well, you know, I just thought God was, uh, I'll, 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 I'll just stay at home. Pastor John, you're just meddling. Yes, I'm trying to get you to heaven. Amen. I'm being like Mr. Rogers with a nine. 
I'm in your neighborhood. I will pull a cap on you. Are you getting this? When her sympathizing Jewish friends saw Mary run out, they thought that she was headed to the grave to mourn Lazarus. Mary goes to meet Jesus. This is the Mary who sat at his feet. She wept on his feet. She poured oil on him. She massaged his feet. Took her hair and dried it. It's a sign of surrender, submission. Martha, the busybody, who served in the ministry of helps and made the meals, making sure all of everything's right, just, you know, you're gonna... Does that taste okay? You like that? Good. Both of them are there now. She's coming out, and they both they said the same thing. I want you to notice Mary's response. Mary says the exact same thing that Martha said. If you would have been here, he'd be alive by now. Isn't it funny how they both had the same expectation, and they both put the same terms and circumstances on how they believe God should have moved? Am I talking to anybody? Here's some things I want you to see about Mary and Martha. We know that Lazarus, but they both know that we know that Lazarus will, will be raised from the dead. Here's what I want you to see. Both Mary and Martha had church with Jesus in their house. Is that true? Yes. Both served Jesus in some form or capacity. Martha was in the ministry of helps. She prepared the food. While she was preparing the food, making sure everything's good, trying to take care of the master. Did you know that God will assign people into your life to take care of you? Yes. Are you getting this? Mary anointed him. Both of them. Both of them heard the word preached. Is that true? Amen. Evidently, Martha had a revelation. She must have caught something. She was like my wife. My wife is a multitasker. You don't think she's listening? She is. <laughs> While she's looking at the TV and the laptop and on the cell phone. She can do that. I cannot. I have smoke coming from my ears. I have to remind her. Defective. I'm a male. One thing at a time, please. <laughs> don't come on, me. Get this woman out of the sanctuary. Why? Because our brains are designed for one thing, to fix something, to conquer something, to kill something, and in my case, to eat something. <laughs> they both heard the word preached, right? Both responded to Lazarus' death in the same way. If, if, if you were here, you could have stopped this. But it was, <laughs> it was Martha who said, even now. Not Mary, the one who's listening. They were both in the same church services. Both of them were in the same church services. We think, we've been taught, Mary's the one who got it. But when the crisis came, it wasn't Mary who responded to the crisis. It was Martha. Because she said, even now. And Jesus corrected her verbiage. Nah, even now is good. You're there, you're there. Let's change her even now to right now. Yeah. When do you want this miracle to happen? Well, even now. No, 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 no. I didn't right now. Right now. I'm looking for an army of believers. For family members in this church who will believe with us to meet the terms and conditions of a revival. William Seymour, who led the revival on Azusa Street, if you never looked it up, he had one eye. That's the night. Do you know what he did to get a revival? God had him put a box on his head to tune everything out, and he prayed for about eight hours. And that started the revival. I can sit down on a box and complain for about eight hours and get the fruit of that real quick. 
You see, he was willing to make a personal sacrifice to get what was beneficial for the whole house. Are you getting this? You ever have relatives stay with you? They stay in their room and they don't come and help clean up. They just clean their mess. They just vacuum their room. They don't care about the rest out. They just do their dishes. They don't bother to help the people that they're staying with. This is just, this is what I soiled. This is what I, this is my dish. I'm not doing your dishes. Yeah, but you in my house. We do things communal here. We have a belief system. My money is Karen's money. Karen's money is her money. It's communal. That's how we work. That's how we are in church. But we want a revival. We want a healing move. We want an outpouring of blessings. We want the anointing. And I, I want, I want. And God, if I don't get what I want, I'm going to complain. And I'm just not going to come to church. And I'm not going to do my duties, my assignment, my obligations. I'm not going to keep my word because you're not giving me what I want. So I'm going to stay at home with the mourners. And then Pastor John has the audacity to get up in my grill. And I'm not taking it back. <laughs> Whatever happened to the mentality like Martha? You know the most dynamic person in the Bible. The person with the greatest faith ever was a teenage girl. Her name was Mary. One star-filled night, this light shows up. This angel, Mary, young, frightened teenage girl, having an angelic encounter betrothed to a man untouched and this light permeates where she's at and this voice comes out of the light Mary highly favored of God are you getting this? highly favored of God God has chosen you you shall have a child but Lord I I don't know anybody. I, I haven't even slept with a man. I'm not going to have a child. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. A moment of terror. Don't know what's going on. And her response to the unknown, to something that has never happened before, was, so be it unto me. If that's what you want to do to me, I accept it. We have some mighty Bible heroes in the Bible. But Mary tops them all. Because after that happened, she got pregnant by the Holy Ghost. People started talking. Look at that Mary. When Jesus was alive doing his ministry, hey, there's crazy Mary and Jesus' brothers, you know, the Messiah. <laughs> yeah, she got pregnant out of wedlock. Yeah, uh huh. Send her babies to Son of God. Are you getting this? I wonder what would happen if we would start being compliant to the Word and becoming a people of integrity again and honor again. And fulfilling our obligations and doing God's word and doing it his way. That's why it's called Yahweh. Not your way, his way. Yahweh. To do it his way. If I want revival, I've got to do it his way. If I want healing, I can't go and eat three stacks of pancake and expect God to help me lose weight. Are you getting this? I don't care how much whipped cream and chocolate chips you put on it. And it smiles at me. I got to do my part. And we always want the easy way out. I don't want to go and die. I don't want a pill. 
don't want to exercise. That's the only exercise I want to do. Whew, man, tired. <laughs> See, we've become such a shortcut society. And then we set the terms and conditions like Mary and Martha did. But Jesus raised them from the dead. They both said the same thing. Well, you know, you could have done something had you been here on time. You and I are guilty of the same thing. Let me close with this. <laughs> Let's go to John chapter 11, verse 45. Jesus said this, and it's been so misrepresented. Jesus said, Lazarus' illness, his death is going to give God glory. Is that what it said? Denominational teachers have said, see, that God puts sickness on you for the glory of God, which is totally erroneous. Right. God doesn't work with the enemy. He's not in cahoots with them to teach you a lesson. You don't take your baby's hand, put it on a hot stove, and teach him hot. And then under cool water, cool. You don't do that. So how did God get the glory? From Lazarus' sickness and death. Verse 45. The mourners that were with Mary and, and, and uh, Martha. They came to fill the house for seven days. They would come up and, I'm sorry for your loss. And forgive me. Here, here's, here's a casserole. How did God get the glory from his sickness and death? Verse 45. It says, many of the Jews that were with Mary and Martha believed on him. They were saved. See, one life would have been Lazarus. But when all those Jews believed, they died and became new creatures in Christ because they chose to believe on him. How did God get the glory out of Lazarus' testimony? Others got saved. When you share your business with people, you can share it as a testimony or you can keep complaining like the mourners. It's all on how you say it. And every mourner that was in the house with Mary and Martha, when they saw that Jesus had raised them from the dead, that's how God got the greater glory. Let me say this. Some of you sometimes do not understand why you go through what you're going through. It may not be because of you, but it may be because of the people around you so they can see how you go through the fire and still get the gold. Are you getting this? I don't know how you did it. Let me tell you, his name is Jesus. Yeah. I can't do this on my own. Yeah. And what happens? It gives God the glory. They believed because of Lazarus. It was too late. Jesus was not on time. We never thought it. Martha's being accused of not getting it. She's the first one that ran out. She got it. Lazarus came back from the dead. Many Jews got saved. When you come to church, if you come to church, what is your takeaway? Because the evidence of what you took away is how you handle a personal crisis. A lot of people nowadays, they go on Facebook and, and, and share all their feelings. And when you do that, the Bible says where two or more gathered together is touching anything, you get people to agree with your feelings. Oh, you poor thing. Praying for you. It's one thing to ask for prayer and faith. If you're going to pray, if, if people tell me I'm praying for you, I ask them, what are you praying about? Oh, amen. Come on. I want to know. Don't pray for me. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. No, no. What, what are you standing on? Are you agreeing with me in, in faith? Or are you doing one of them sympathy prayers? Are you getting into this? When you come to church, what's your takeaway? I don't know about you. I want to walk away with faith in my heart. Yeah. 
Amen. And if I'm going through a crisis, I know I want to be able to contact someone and say, hey, listen, I need you to worship with me. If I can't worship, can you worship on my behalf? You need to surround yourself with people who will push you into the Word, not pull you back into the world. You have no business there. You just end up polluted, what the Bible said. This morning, we're going to take communion. Let's go ahead and begin to hand out communion elements. We invite you to take it if you'd like to. If you're not, if you don't want to, please don't. But I want you to examine yourself, your life, have you been setting the terms and conditions on your relationship with God? Or have you been obedient and compliant to His Word so that you can get the fullness of His benefits? The Bible promises. Are you walking in love? Are you a person of honor and integrity? The Bible says in God's house, there are many vessels. Many who have good intentions. Some are honorable and some aren't. How's your walk with God? What's your takeaway? Do you feel like sitting with the mourners still? Or are you ready to say, you know what? Y'all need to clear the house. Because I'm ready to get back into worship. And I'm ready to get back. I'm not going to come to church and put on a performance in front of everybody. I want the anointing. I want a healing revival. I want to see people like Miss Shirley get healed. Amen. I want to see Miss Irene walk out of that wheelchair, Amen. pick up that tambourine, and jump higher than the ceiling fans in this place. Amen. Huh? I want to see Dwayne, Brother Dwayne, out of that hospital, never have to worry about it again. Amen. I want to see everybody in this place, you and your family, healed, yes. delivered. What do I mean by delivered? Some of y'all got habits, you should be quitting. Well, I don't do drugs no more, no, but you overeat. It's not good for your heart. The doctor already warned you. Is this too rough? No. I don't care. Some of y'all need healing in your mind and in your heart. Especially from yesteryears. Some of you need to get out of your cave and start living life instead of wasting it in the bedroom. It's time to start living again. It's time for us to rise up and take back what the devil has stolen. Can I have a better amen? Amen. Now, I don't know about you. Is there something that the, the enemy has stolen in your life? So a lot of we let's stop hanging around with the mourners. And let's make a declaration that even now, right now, God is changing my circumstances. There's a calm that's coming to my storm. The enemy is being removed. When you take communion this morning, why don't you ask God to give you an honest answer on how your relationship with Him really is. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm trying to get you to heaven. But I'm not going to sit here and make you feel good. I'm going to help you adjust your sails so you can get on course and make it to heaven. If you want to feel good, go to the movie theater. If you want truth, that sets you free. And that's what we need to choose. I don't know about you. I want to be a hundredfold believer. I want truth to dominate my life. I don't want a spirit of error. I want, if, if I'm doing something wrong, I want the Holy Ghost to jack me up against the wall, put his finger up right up to my nose and say, boy, if you don't get your act together, are you getting it? You don't amen that so quickly. <laughs> I want God. I'm desperate for Him. There's nothing more important. Not a business. Not a soccer game. Not a personal event. Not a family outing. Well, you know, it's so-and-so's birthday. Have a cake later. Teach them what you want them to know. To put God first. Because when we go through a crisis, that's what we want. We want God first. If you got hate, get rid of the hate. If you can't stand somebody, ask God to forgive you and teach you how to love. 
you have animosity, if you got strife, if you got a, Pastor Karen was teaching about having a, a judgmental, critical spirit, repent of it. We call communion, it's called sometimes the meal that heals. It could do so much because of the blood that it represents in the body. I'm not going to say anything audibly concerning communion, but I want you to take communion between you and the Lord. When you're ready to eat the bread, you pray over it this morning. You bless it. And you receive the benefits, the healing. When you drink the juice, you pray over it. What do you want the blood to do in your life? Right now. Lord, right now, I need to address myself. Pastor Karen shredded me Wednesday night. I am so grateful for her. Just so grateful. Because I don't know about you, sometimes I need the slack pulled out of me, don't you? Turn to someone and say, turn, ask your wife, she'll tell you, yeah. Ask your husband, he'll tell you, yeah, you too, sweetheart. I want to be real with God. I don't want this fake, pretentious, come to church, act like everything's right, when it's really not. But the move of God starts with me. It starts with me first. If you want it, get desperate. Be desperate for Him. Maestro, if you'll give me some music, we'll let them take communion on their own as they examine themselves this morning. Just something worshipful. I pray that you are blessed. If I offended you, it's a great opportunity for you to grow and learn to walk in forgiveness. If you get a chance to be here tonight, we'd love to have you. No, 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 something worshipful, please. Thank you. I guess I should have communicated that better. So we'll, we'll do that for as we leave. Just one song. Let's turn on the lights for just a moment, too, please. Hallelujah. Just spend a moment.